And hello, and welcome to a seminar that's one in a series of evidence into policy and practice seminars convened by the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex in the UK. My name is Peter Taylor. I'm IDS's Director of Research, and I'll be moderating today's seminar. And this seminar is entitled Research Uptake and Impact, How Do Funders See Its Future? Now, as planned originally, this seminar was part of our IDS short course on shaping policy with evidence, which was due to be taking place right now which unfortunately has been impacted this year due to the challenges of COVID-19. We're looking forward to running it again next year. We may also be exploring a virtual running of that course. But those interested in our events and our publications and courses on evidence use can sign up for our evidence and policy newsletter on the IDS website, www.ids.ac.uk. And the link to the newsletter will be found in the chat function as well. So I'd like to start by taking this opportunity to acknowledge the enormous global challenge that's currently playing out in the form of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I really appreciate that every single person joining this webinar, panelists and audience alike, are grappling with major issues and disruptions in their lives as we speak, as well as facing significant uncertainties about their futures for themselves, their families, friends and colleagues and their organizations and their fellow citizens. I just wanted to thank you all for making time to join this event and to send you all personal wishes for your health and safety. And the COVID-19 pandemic perhaps makes even more clear the importance of the issue that we're going to discuss in today's seminar. We know that donors' approaches to engaging evidence with policy and practice and evaluating its impact constantly evolve. Investments have ranged from funding international knowledge programs to support for project embedded research communications to building research capacity and interdisciplinarity and to system strengthening. And research continues to underpin many of the efforts to address big global challenges. We also know that concepts of evidence production and use remain contested. So how can we ensure that research delivers real benefits to communities facing rising inequalities, the effects of a changing climate, risks to the health and well-being and conflict and violence. So right now in the context of COVID-19, we're seeing the vital importance of evidence, the need for quality data, for rigorous analysis, and for balanced and informed interpretation. And we also see the desire by policymakers and citizens alike to have policies and decisions that will help us cope and address these huge complex challenges like COVID-19, but which inevitably given the fast moving situation and constantly shifting contexts, are often also based on imperfect and at times deliberately misleading information. So our core question then is, how can we ensure that research delivers real benefits to communities facing rising inequalities, the effects of a changing climate, risks to their health and well-being, and conflict and violence? And we're hoping to get an idea of how donors and influencers conceptualize evidence use, what role they see for themselves moving forward in supporting evidence-informed policy and practice, with a special emphasis on development in lower middle income countries. So now to our panelists, and today we have a really great panel. Thank you to all of them for leading, of, of leading international funders and influencers who are helping to shape the agenda on evidence-informed policymaking and research uptake and impact. Firstly, Norma Altshuler, Program Officer in Global Development and Population at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. With a background and qualifications in public policy, Norma manages a portfolio of grants designed to increase the use of data and evidence to improve public policies in developing countries, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. Previously, Norma helped found the Global Innovation Fund, where she also built a grant portfolio supporting evidence-informed innovations in developing countries. She's also worked with USIAD and for several social enterprises and nonprofits in East Africa, as well as undertaking evaluations of development and social protection programs. Second, Maggie gorman Villes, Director of Policy and Evaluation at Canada's International Development Research Centre, IDRC, in Ottawa, Canada. With an academic background in political economy, gender and international development, Maggie's professional experience in the international research and development field includes strategy development, risk management, corporate performance, monitoring and evaluation. She's been with IDRC since 2004 and has worked on private sector interventions in the development space and the impacts of research support during periods of conflict and transition. And she's had roles in partnerships and vice presidents and president's office. Third, Jonathan Brecken, Director for the Alliance for Useful Evidence. And Jonathan's been Director of the Alliance for Useful Evidence since it was created at Nesta, an innovation foundation, formerly the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts in 2012. Formerly Director of Policy and Public Affairs at the Arts and Humanities Research Council, he's had policy roles at the Royal Geographical Society, the British Academy and Universities UK. 
He's a member of the UK Cabinet Office What Works Council and the director of the Department for Education's What Works for Children's Social Care. His research and professional interests cover politics and psychology, particularly the ever awkward relationship between evidence and policy making. And he's a visiting professor at Strathclyde University and a visiting senior research fellow at King's College London's Policy Institute. And last but not least, Pamela Mason, who's head of International Development Economic, of the Economic and Social Research Council, the SRC. With an academic background and a PhD in inorganic chemistry, Pam joined the ESRC in 2017 as strategic lead for international development. With a particular interest in interdisciplinary research, her career since 20, 2006 has included roles of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and the Medical Research Council. And the international development team is responsible for maintaining ESRC's relationships with key international development agencies, including the Department for International Development. The team leads on ESRC's engagement with the Global Challenges Research Fund, through which a key aim is to expand the capacity of the UK research base to engage in international partnerships working to address major development challenges. So welcome to all our panelists, especially to Norma, who, uh, for whom it is 7 a.m. in the morning. So really appreciate her joining from California. Now, given all that's happening in the world currently, this seminar seems very timely. And it's not surprising that it's attracted quite a large audience. In fact, I believe it's the largest sign up for any idea seminar. And we're going to run it as follows. First, with a series of questions to our panelists, and then by opening it up to all of our audience and inviting you to post your messages in the chat function. So apologies that we don't have the facility to hear you speak your questions in person, but we'll do our very best to ensure we ask and have responses to as many of your questions as we can manage. You might at times hear the voice of my IDS colleague, Gary Edwards, who's going to help monitor the questions and who's been a big support with the technology behind this call as well. We hope we won't suffer any major problems with quality of sound or image. Uh, like many of those who are on the call, uh, we're all, uh, we're almost all, I'm sure, at home. And uh, so they're surrounded by the possibility for unexpected things to happen. But if anything does uh, happen like that, please bear with us and we'll do our best to have a good experience. So again, welcome all. And we're going to start by requesting some opening remarks from each panelist. And first of all, we'd like you, each panelist, to inter explain in turn why the topic of this seminar is important for you, and also how do you understand the impact of research? Impact on what and for whom? And Norma, if I could start with you. Thanks, Peter. And just to echo Peter, thanks so much to all of you for joining us during this complicated time. I, for me personally, Evidence is really about using the best tools we have to improve lives. My guess is that many of you, all of you, share this conviction. And turning to Hewlett institutionally, our focus is on African governments using evidence, and again, with the ultimate goal around improving lives. Perhaps our defining feature is that we view African governments themselves as our client. Let me tell you why we got to that proposition. Seven years ago, Hewlett's global development and population team looked back on our long, proud tradition of investing in policy research. Our research grantees had had important successes, but as is essentially always the case with policy research, the track record of evidence improving policy was mixed. Many of our partners struggled with the same challenges, ones that probably all of you are familiar with, such as policymakers not having the incentives to use evidence, or needing to make decisions more quickly than researchers could provide them with information. So we started asking ourselves if we could do anything systematic to improve our success rate and the success rate of others who conduct or commission policy research. At the same time, we were observing appetite from evidence from pockets of governments in our priority geographies of East and West Africa. Of course, this wasn't universal, but we saw pockets of government officials that really believed that evidence could help them deliver for their own political careers or deliver and or deliver for the citizens that they valued. So we decided to ask ourselves what would happen if we treated decision makers as clients, if we asked our, them how research and data could help them improve outcomes for citizens. One of the ways we do this is by supporting organizations on the ground in Africa that share this ethos. These policy research organizations, whether they're pockets of talent in a university, national organizations, or INGOs with on the ground presence, help governments apply existing research to their time sensitive questions or generate new research that decision makers get on the timeline that they need it. One example that speaks to this moment is the NGO ID Insight. They serve government ministries around the world. 
essentially their client service organization and the service is timely evidence. They, like many of our partners, find that when you help a client government solve a problem, they're receptive to evidence, future evidence-based advice, or even they come to you and seek it out. So it's no surprise that governments are actively turning them for advice on how to manage COVID, on how to mitigate it, and on how we to gear up for responses. For example, Ghana's Ministry of Education, a long-standing evidence client, is trying to figure out how to op open schools safely when they reopen, which will likely be before COVID is fully behind us. ID Insights helping them figure out contextually appropriate ways to screen out the sickest kids. They're also helping the Ministry of Education draw on behavior change literature to design ways that kids can encourage each other to wash hands and to stay distant. So treat, my, the main point here is that treating governments as clients and helping address a, the government's priorities helps increase research use. The ongoing relationships of trust matter as much as the research. When governments see that evidence can help solve their problems, they come back for more, especially if the organizations to offer to work with them again. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Thanks, Norma. Great. Maggie, over to you for your response. Thanks very much, Peter, and welcome everyone. And I'm glad you could join us uh, today. So I think what this situation and what this pandemic is really driving home for me is the urgency of the research that we're all supporting. And this is really twofold. So this is about ensuring that we have the mechanisms to be responsive, to be quick, and to be flexible, to respond to emerging needs and clear gaps in the time of crisis, but also making sure that we have the foresight and the ability to look beyond what's right in front of our faces to think about what's coming around the corner, what's coming down the pipe later on that, other, that others aren't thinking about currently. That's such an important focus and function of research. So um, from a donor's perspective, I think from this urgency can really come innovation encouraging us to think differently about our processes, about the way we fund research, about why we're doing this and who, for whom we're doing this, and for what makes high quality research, in fact. Um, so at Canada's International Development Research Center, where I uh, work, we're, we were created to respond to issues and, and fund research in the developing world and with our developing world colleagues that could be specifically linked to change, to positive change and to impact. So one of the things um, that's really on our mind and that we've done a lot of thinking about in the last couple of years is what are the factors that we believe about research, about how we do research, that's going to position it to be most apt to succeed, to be most apt to link to eventual solutions and to have impact. So questions that we're asking ourselves are, is the research legitimate? So who is driving the research? Who's feeding into the knowledge? And are we drawing on local knowledge perspectives? And we did a review recently um, uh, across our research and across our research results and elements of those who are closest to the problem being able to best aptly respond um, and drive solutions and ask the right questions indeed was an important factor. And those actors that are closest to the problem are also the ones that can identify the key players that the research needs to then connect to, to identify feasible and relevant solutions. Another question um, we're asking ourselves in terms of how research is done is does it robustly consider differentiated outcomes for different populations? And this is a crucial um, consideration of the methodology, no matter what the domain. So how does the proposed solution um, play out for different genders, for example, play out for different vulnerable sectors of society? And we believe that in order to measure the impact or the robustness of the research that can then be positioned for impact, 
we need to consider these factors. Secondly, I think many institutions, including my own and including um, Hewlett, uh, that just spoke about their approach to using um, African governments as clients, in the midst of crisis, as well as during normal times, we're thinking about how to translate knowledge from, from existing research that can be helpful in offering responses to, to a particular crisis, but also to, to broader issues, broader challenges that we're grappling with. So in a way, a, a context of crisis, where we're all in a situation of isolation, and we know that field research will be limited at least for, for the next little while. I think another important factor is that we should be disciplined in asking what do we already have in our shelves? What do we already have that we can use? And this requires uh, thinking differently about impact. It's not only initiating new work, but it's looking to existing solutions and thinking about how can we scale those? How can we adapt them? Um, and on the flip side, at the same time as we're looking for solutions and looking to adapt them, we're also faced with, I think, a deluge of information, evidence, information, views, research of all kinds that's coming our way, and a real interest from the public, as Peter mentioned in the opening, to, um, to consume more analysis and evidence. But I think we also have to think carefully about how can we synthesize this work and analyze it and package it in a way that can be useful for those with limited bandwidth, such as the government players that um, my colleague was speaking to, or policymakers thinking about how to adapt their international assistance in response to such a crisis. Great, Maggie. Thanks. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you, sir. I think there's three areas where we can really uh, see that research can make a difference. And I'm all in favour of pointless, useless research that's beautiful in its own right, whether it's physics or philosophy, it doesn't have an impact for decades to come. But for most of us, uh, we want to make a real difference to people's lives and we want to do it as soon as possible. And COVID 19 just uh, really reinforces that sense of urgency. And in terms of the, those three areas, the obvious one that we usually think about in this space of where evidence can be useful is on the, the kind of instrumental uh, front. So you know, what can we do in a really practical way to help with, say, hand washing for people who might not have access to, to clean water, where space is difficult for, say, self-isolation? We know about that. Evidence can help with that, and also particularly the kind of the cost effectiveness of things because money and resources is limited. But I think the second area, and this has really come up in the current crisis, is around the evidence we can apply around communication, behavior change. Um, I've just come off a, a call with Ofcom, which is the UK's regulatory body on communications, uh, working on disinformation. And there is so much we can learn from a range of social sciences about how we can effectively communicate our messages. Some of this is controversial. Um, there's been some criticism of nudging and behavioral research, certainly in the UK, uh, but the World Health Organization sees it as absolutely crucial that this is a, a human impacted problem with human mitigation and we need to learn from the best of, of social psychology and other behavioral science. The third area where I think we really have value is, is an area where I struggle to get the message across because so often we think about this with policymakers, but evidence can help the front line for professionals, so people uh, out there in the field um, delivering public services. And I was involved in a what work center for social workers in the UK. And um, we got a little bit of a sort of misunderstanding because we were doing a lot for social workers and dealing with their stress, uh, their attention, simple things sometimes, but rather than just thinking about the children they're helping, helping those frontline uh, 
civil servants, public servants, how you, how you want to, to, to deal with it. But I think that is crucial as one of our audiences, not just the big sort of government figures or uh, uh, others. But finally, to, to kind of summarize this, there's another value, which is what Carol Weiss called the, the, the enlightenment value of research. So it's not just instrumental, uh, it's also helping people think about the value of, of slow thinking. This is the difficult box, right? It's not easy applying research. This is particularly in COVID-19 where there's so much uncertainty. Uh, there's no point pretending that uh, we have all the answers. But applying what we know from research, uh, even if it's the, the simple message that, you know, a linear model of research out the door and it'll magically land or we just get more information on how to deal with COVID-19, we know through vast bodies of research there's never enough. You know, we're, things are much more complicated than that. So that enlightenment value, I think, is essential. Thanks, Jonathan. And for the last uh, response for this round, Pam, over to you. Yeah, hello. Um, um, I'm going to apologise in advance for my cat, who's also particularly interested in impact. So uh, she may appear. Um, so, I mean, this topic is incredibly important to ESRC and UKRI as a whole. We're an organisation that not only aims to support excellent research, but also aims to ensure that that research has a real world, makes a real world difference and has an impact. This current crisis and the way in which research from multiple disciplines is being used to inform the response, I think is a really prime example of why research, as, as my colleagues on the panel have already said, why research is so important. What I think needs to be made clear is that that diversity of perspectives is even more important if we only look at epidemiology, virology, and uh, the medical research, we're only ever going to see half of the story. Um, and as Jonathan said, the behavioral side and the psychology um, around this is, is just as important um, to be aware of as the, as the medical research. We need to take a truly holistic approach and look at environmental factors. Um, water sanitation in parts of the world is a real um is a real factor in in people being able to um to have good hygiene and stop the spread of the disease so um so you know there's a whole raft of different factors and ukri um are supporting new research that's just been commissioned in the last two weeks um in response to this crisis and across a breadth of disciplines from um engineering to, to create new ventilators um, or ventilator substitutes all the way through to, to psychological research and behavioral science. Um, in terms of how I understand impact of research, I think again, colleagues have already touched on the fact that there's a whole breadth of different impacts that can be made from research all the way from, from uh, fundamental creation of new knowledge changing a discourse around a particular um, area of study, um, all the way through to, to on the ground real world change, um, impact that creates positive change in people's lives. Now you can't have the second without the first. You have to have that fundamental basic research knowledge in order to lead ultimately to that instrumental impact of creating a positive change. Um, and I think um, Maggie touched on this urgency factor and the, the, the situation we're in at the moment where we've needed a really rapid response to something that is completely new um, without that fundamental basis of research that, and that body of research that we have from, you know, some of it will be very, will be very blue skies, technological research or, you know, completely unrelated behavioral science that has all been able to be galvanized in response to this current crisis and i think that shows how important that basic new knowledge creation is to responding um, to a crisis such as this and being able to actually make instrumental changes and policy related impact in the world um, i think policy and practice change is one example of an impact that is relatively easily measurable. You can, you can 
identify and, 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 and measure the change that has come about as a result of something instrumental like that. What you can't measure as easily are those longer term impacts from a basic, um, basic body of research that has ultimately made a huge difference in the world. But the path to the trajectory of that research and that knowledge into that more instrumental impact is a lot harder to track. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges that, that we face is how do we capture and how do we measure the impact that research that we're supporting is having when, when it might take such a long time, you know, we could be talking decades before something has an actual real world impact. Um, so that's something that, that I think we need to try and try and get better at, try and kind of track these changes in, in, over time. Thanks, Pam. And, and it strikes me, having had conversations with, uh, with a number of colleagues on the panel that uh, previously, that you know, some of the, the things that each of you are raising are also things that others are thinking about in their own organizational context. So it'll be good as we go through the session to, you know, to hear responses as well from other panelists, for, you know, just for example, on that very question around uh, thinking about how do you understand how, how to measure or to assess impact as it unfolds over a long period of time. So I think also the other thing that strikes me as well, you know, that question was very much around, well, why is this important to you? And of course, needless to say, a lot of the framing has been in the context of COVID-19 and the pandemic that we're all experiencing. So I think uh, even though this is not an experience that we would have wished anyone to be uh, going through, at the same time, it's providing a backdrop for a situation that in a way, what we do through supporting research and undertaking research can speak to the very complex issues and interconnectedness of the challenges which are arising from what in this case uh, is predominantly a health challenge but has a vast array of different social economic and environmental um, implications as well so with that in mind let's go on to another couple of questions and again i'm going to do the same thing ask each of you to respond um, and these are really around first of all how what do you see as the main barriers to evidence use in policy and practice. I think you've already touched on those a little bit in your introductions, but perhaps to say a little bit more about that. And then also from your experience uh, from where you're working, how have you successfully created or helped to create an enabling environment for evidence uptake? So Norma, if we can come back to you to start us off. Thanks, Peter, and definitely agree. We're wrestling with lots of the same challenges and it'll be great to get deeper into shared solutions later in the panel. So you've probably all heard the metaphor of a road to drive to just describe the journey from evidence to policy. There are a lot of factors that can make roads impassable. Poor capacity within governments, lack of incentives, lack of relationships between researchers and decision makers. Might be clear who the decision unclear who the decision makers even are. Might be and they may not have accountability, and there may be a lack of government systems to use data and, and evidence. These are all things that make the journey from evidence to policy, this road, hard. As my colleague at Vivian Sen at the William T. Grant Foundation has pointed out, to make it even more complicated, this journey is really a complicated highway system with twists and turns that requires skilled navigation. And I think one thing that's heartening is in part because of work that my colleagues have done to help their research grantees become a little bit more policy oriented, our community has made real progress in developing political savvy and communication skills so that every individual researcher can better drive down this road. But at Hewlett, we're trying to think beyond the uptake of any specific piece of evidence, beyond any journey down the road, and more about improving the whole highway system. So bear with me for the metaphor for one moment longer. How do we make the road, the road easier for everyone to drive down? One of the barriers I talked about is systems that governments use to rely on decision making. Let me tell you about one joint initiative between AFIDEP, the African Institute for Development and Economic Policy, and APHRC, the African Population Health and Research Center. Many of you are probably familiar with these two Kenyan policy research organizations. They're trying to improve the road by strengthening data, government data systems improving the flow of data between county and national levels and across sectors. They'll help governments have better quality data and use it to solve problems. And also importantly for this group, to figure out what research to consider. For example, AFIDEP's past work helped government officials 
no under have age disaggregated data and know how old women and girls with unwanted pregnancies were. So they knew whether literature on school-based interventions was even relevant, and AFIDEP helped them figure out what literature was. How else can we improve the roads? One more quick example. Two of the barriers I touched on are policymakers' capacity and relationships between evidence producers and evidence users. GIMPA, the Ghana Institute for Management and Public Administration, has a method of tackling both. They bring in US, Ghanaian, and Ghanaian researchers and West African policymakers to set research agendas together. As they move forward, with, forward, they're building capacity for the West African decision makers to commission evaluations and to use specific ones to inform policy decisions and also building relationships. So you're tackling two of the road problems, policymakers capacity and relationships. So the point is that I think that we all have a real opportunity to, as we think about how we can enable research use to be thinking beyond our own pieces of research and towards the enabling environment, the systems, relationships, and capacities that make it a bit easier for the journey for everyone. Thanks, Norma. Maggie, your response. Thanks, and uh, some of my thoughts, I think, build on what Norma was mentioning in terms of uh, the superhighway research. Um, so I'll speak to three main barriers um, that I think exist and some ideas on how, how to respond to those. So first is indeed the enabling environment for research. So. I mean, part of IDRC's approach is to not only think about um, the importance of funding excellent research, but thinking through what's the enabling environment for research, particularly in the global south. Are there um, adequate or um, existing domestic funding sources for research? What's the functioning of the granting council system, for example, and can we help strengthen that? Um, our research systems more broadly uh, needing strengthening? Um, what's the status of the institution behind the research? Um, how, as a donor, are we supporting the pipeline of capacities for research? So these are all pieces of the enabling environment, recognizing that research doesn't take place in a vacuum, and if we're expecting research excellence, we have to understand that bigger system that supports this. And I think one way we can respond to that is to actually listen to our grantees. So that's a, a very simple point, but essentially um, they're aware of their research context and what it requires and what they require to do to produce the excellent research that we're all uh, looking for. Um, so that means, uh, for example, in a recent review that we did, or an evaluation we did on um, support to think tanks, we saw, which was supported by a range of donors, including the Hewlett Foundation and others, it showed that um, the organizations that were best able to translate research into action, whether it be through policy making or through working with the private se sector, et cetera, were those who had the capacities to spend time um, working on strategic planning, to spend time building their research communications capacities and engaging with the end users of the research through the research cycle. And I don't think we can overlook this, that we often, the funding cycle often um, focuses specifically on the research, but we need to think about what are the other um, vital actions that the institutions behind their research need to do and need to spend their time doing in order to translate that into action. Um, the second point I wanted to make was, a, uh, which is a major barrier, I think is the expectations of one institution or one, even one researcher, one team of researchers to do it all. Um, we need vital, um, actors to come together to be engaged in the research process that will take, that will play different roles, um, who have different skills in terms of communicating the research. Um, we need to find ways to think about 
um, engaging actors that we're very uncomfortable engaging with in the research sector, such as the private sector, such as maybe NGO sector in terms of taking things forward. So I think all of these um, factors play a role in maybe the innovation that needs to happen in rethinking how um, donors expect in the end, at the end stage to come up with high quality, excellent research, we need to think about what the different skills, what the different enabling environments are that we also need to nurture in order for that to happen. Thanks, Maggie. Great. Jonathan, your thoughts. Uh, those are two perfect overviews, really. So I'm going to focus on one thing. Um, and it's because I spent my entire career, I don't know why, within this <laughs> This area of getting research to have impact, whether it's being in, in donor funding bodies or in other organizations. Um, but I think there's, there's one thing that comes up again and again is the issue of timing. And uh, we organized an event with a, a government minister who rather cheekily sort of said to us, the problem about you academics is you answer yesterday's problem tomorrow. Um, and it turned out he actually had a PhD and he's an academic, so he was making mischief. But there is something in that. And it, I think it's an inherently the good thing about what we do is that we're not running around uh, doing what a particular political advisor uh, I know did once, which is had to write a research briefing uh, literally within the afternoon uh, for a minister. You know, we do need that slow thinking. We do need the criticism. You know, the theoretical end of things, that's such a core strength of ours. But we do need to find a way to make that timing uh, faster and get that, op that highway. Maybe the speed limits need to be opened up a little bit more. Thanks, Jonathan. And uh, you're giving some food for thought, I'm sure, for all of the uh, participants who are on the call. Um, before we come around to a final question, which is, is kind of around forward-looking uh, things before we open it up, Pam, your thoughts. Thanks, Peter. So um, I think uh, everybody's touched on um, all the crucial points already. I think I had um, kind of three main main points that I wanted to make in terms of barriers. I think the first one for me is, is the question of getting it out there. And I think we all know that effective knowledge exchange requires effective relationships. And in many cases, those relationships need to be personal relationships um, between researchers and policy actors and policy makers. So that means that if you're um, trying to have an impact on an African Ministry of Health, for example, a UK researcher dropping in uh, to, that, to that Ministry of Health is not going to have the same personal relationship and local knowledge as a researcher who um, was born, raised and educated in that country. So it, it's, I think the key point is that it needs local relationships. It needs personal relationships. And in order to achieve that, and I think Maggie touched on this, is that you may need to do quite a bit of capacity strengthening in those countries in order to enable those local relationships and those local knowledge exchange partnerships. Um, the second point that I wanted to make, which again, I think has already been touched on, is about political appetite um, and whether the politics of a particular country or state um, mean that it's open to taking account of evidence in a particular area or on a particular topic, whether that research is a particular priority for that country at the time. And this all leads to uh, the, the timeliness question. So can you get the timing of this, um, of this research right in order to make it meaningful um, and translatable into, um, into, into policy making and to, um, to real world impact? Um, in terms of an enabling environment um, for evidence uptake, um, so UKRI and ESRC have, have implemented a number of things over the years. Um, 
In the UK, we've run a placement scheme into the UK Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology over a number of years, which is about embedding researchers in the policy making environment to develop those relationships and get a real understanding of the political environment. Um, and that's something that, that potentially we could look to, um, to replicate in a global context. Um, we have um, uh, impact accelerator accounts um, in UK universities, which is, is flexible funding given to an, an institution and it's intended to help the research institutions develop partnerships with stakeholders, partnerships with businesses, partnerships with policymakers to enable the research that is generating um, generated through that institution to be more easily um, translatable and, and enable that knowledge exchange to happen in a more um, in a more streamlined way. Um, also, you know, we have functions such as the Impact Initiative, who've been coordinating um, coordinating this event, and um, uh, the Impact Initiative are a function that sits across two of our ESRC DFID programs to work with the researchers to help them to translate their research into policy briefings, um, to build relationships with stakeholders, to make connections across projects, um, all with a view to enhancing the opportunity and enhancing the possibilities for those projects to have impact. Uh, there, are, there are myriad other, other kind of mechanisms that we use, but I think those are probably um, the key ones. Thanks, Pam, that's great. So just uh, in terms of the, how we're moving forward now, I'm going to have one last question uh, to each of our panelists, but I'd just like to invite all of those who are currently listening in, please to field your questions. Hopefully you've got access to the chat function. Um, and if you'd like to put your questions up, we'll start to go through them after this last round and we'll put them to the panelists. So I'm sure you've already got some things now that uh, are striking you. Please start uh, putting those questions down and we'll be ready to be asking some of those very shortly. So before we turn to the questions from uh, the wider audience, uh, colleagues on the panel, I've just got one last question for you. We've had lots of discussion around things that you are already doing, things that you're observing, uh, that wonderful quotation from from Jonathan about trying to avoid answering yesterday's problem tomorrow. Um, lots of priorities, I imagine, within your own organizations. What are the key priorities that you're currently seeing for supporting researchers and policy actors to address global challenges? Norma. Thanks, Peter. So one priority that I've talked about previously and that the other panelists have touched on is responsive, timely research. And there, to Pamela's point about the importance of long-term bodies of knowledge, one tact we find is supporting national researchers who truly have training in long-term methods like impact evaluations or systematic reviews, and the ability to make those tough judgment calls about how do we put the best of long-term carefully gathered information in front of ministers, and just have some also judgment calls based on a current situation like COVID that is, requires both data and common sense. I, I think also within that, to Pamela's other point, we find flexible funding to help organizations respond quickly to be essential to making sure that they have both the ability to build out their long-term skills to have impact, but also to just respond faster than we can write grants. And finally, within that bucket, we also find peer learning to be very helpful as researchers develop their capacity further. For example, as part of this rapid and responsive partnership, we have a great collaboration with the IDRC where we're bringing 13 countries together and technical skills and exchange between peers, as well as around political skills are quite important. I also touched previously on our on our road building priority on understanding the incentives, capacities, and systems, and whether we can actually change government behaviors. There, I'll just say that we have a lot to learn. And one of the things we are interested in maybe research on, certainly peer exchange, is what really unpacking whether and how in the past non-governmental organizations have been able to unpack and change how governments do business. And would love to hear from folks about what research is already out there on that, what other research we might want to do to understand whether and how policy research organizations or other non-governmental actors can truly improve government systems. And then the final priority I'll highlight, building on the priority that I share with many of my colleagues on the panel around local organizations, 
is that as Pamela also touched on, mutual, respectful partnerships in, between researchers across continents or researchers from places like the UK spending time in the countries that their research is about can be hugely impactful. And we also know, as I'm sure Pamela would agree, that these partnerships can also be rift with challenges. So I'm really interested in trying to learn about models of how these partnerships can be as respectful as possible and possibly supporting the commun research community itself in developing some shared norms around things like how to manage co-authorship, how to manage budget, how to have just practical communication tools that make everyone function better. So across these priorities, rapid research, road building and changing systems, and local organizations and international partnerships, I think we have some things that I've highlighted that we are pretty confident are having impact, but one of our key priorities across them all is learning in partnership with this broader community. Thanks, Norma. And I'm already getting the sense of these are really important but hard things to do. So I think hearing from others how they're approaching these, uh, this can be really useful in this, uh, in this call as well. Maggie. Thanks, and I'll, I'll speak to three priorities again, building on, on what uh, Norma and the other um, panelists have already mentioned. So the first is around this idea that Norma ended off on around connecting local to global, um, and specifically local to global evidence and vice versa. So I think in an era of SDGs where we're called to think about global challenges, but also local impact, I think as a funder of research where the research is primarily taking place in the global south, we need to find ways and, and find efforts to connect this research to global uh, policy discussions in a better way, in a more effective way. I think there's a lot of excellent research at the domestic level that doesn't reach the global or international policy landscape. And it's also surprising how um, policymakers tend to rely on the same sources over and over. And I think we have a role to play in facilitating um, access to new knowledge that's extremely important. So that's one priority. A second is, as I mentioned before, the importance of um, knowledge translation and engaging other actors. So first that would be around paying more attention in our grants to the importance of building in time and effort for knowledge translation, synthesis of what's already been done, et cetera. Um, I think it's also about um, anticipating early in the research cycle or in a cohort of research what scaling strategies we're putting in place to think about how to move positive results beyond a localized context, but doing that in a very intentional, uh, responsible way. Um, one of the evaluations that we had done in terms of our uh, an agricultural innovation research program over 10 years is that the innovation itself and its ability to be scaled is only as good as the next community or the next user's capacity in that new context to take the innovation and adapt it for their own purposes. So I think engaging um, in a responsible way when we're thinking about moving research from you know, the theoretical or the pilot phase to a wider, uh, wider base in scaling is an important uh, consideration that we'll be focusing on in the coming years. And then in order to think about moving research along that highway towards impact, we also need to think about how we work and interact as research funders with other sectors. So with the private sector, with um, the users in the public sector, with community actors, um, and not as we've often done in the past at the end of a research project, but thinking about bringing this engagement into the design, into the cycle at, at various points of the cycle of research. And this is really not an area of our comfort. Um, it's an area where we need to think about how, what skills are required of research institutions to be able to do this, to be able to build those types of relationships. 
Um, so I put those three points, local to global evidence, a greater focus on knowledge translation and synthesis, and uh, working for scale by engaging with other sectors. Thank you, Maggie. Great. Uh, Jonathan. Thank you. I'll, I'll just do two, actually, because I've got 20 priorities at least, and we haven't got time for that. But um, I think one thing I'd really like to see is around more of a, a, of a sort of an evidence pull rather than the push. And uh, actually, just before the crisis, um, uh, Her Majesty's Treasury in the UK um, was starting to look at much more rigorous requirements of research for anyone doing a funding bid for them. Now, you can critique that as much as you want, but at least it's trying to get something in the pipeline, in the system. Some, so somebody has to go, actually, what are we going to put in here? And I was impressed by the South African government to how uh, in their uh, white papers and their policy papers, there was a section where you're supposed to set out your workings behind a policy. What's the research behind it? Anything we can do there to make the system more uh, easier so you don't you're not reliant on pushing or entrepreneurial types to encourage research to go in I think are, are helpful as long as it's not about um, playing a particular game or just a sort of audit culture uh, but the second thing as I say very importantly I know there's lots of capacity building programs globally and people like DFID do a lot um, and I was usually a bit cynical about these sort of training programs or not another training program virtually done, but actually they're essential, particularly if they're about creating motivated uh, individuals who can go out there and help, because this stuff is hard, particularly for researchers, but also for policymakers to understand evidence. So, so those are my two, capacity building uh, and that sort of pool of evidence. In. Thanks, Jonathan. And Pam. Yeah, I'm going to um, avoid repeating what um, what others have already said, or try to anyway, but um, I think there are two things that I want to just really emphasise, which have been touched on, but I just want to, to reinforce those. The first for me, in terms of address, addressing truly global challenges, is the concept of interdisciplinarity and the breadth of voices um, that you need contributing to, to um, a particular discourse or a particular um, creating a body of evidence around something. And I think, you know, COVID-19 is, is an excellent example of, um, of this. Um, but I think, you know, there, there are so many, there are so many challenges that need to be making sure the right expertise can be de deployed to the right place um, at the right time in order to answer um, a particular challenge. And it isn't restricted to disciplinary silos. Um, in fact, this, this morning I was having a conversation with colleagues about planetary health and the concept of how human health and the health of the planet and the natural systems are so inextricably linked um, that you cannot consider one without considering the other. And if I think about something like that, I can't think of a single discipline that couldn't make a contribution to, to something kind of that big, something that global and something that kind of fundamental. So I think interdisciplinarity and taking a really holistic approach to, to research is, is really important. The other thing which, um, which others, um, I think Norma particularly touched on, is that concept of partnerships and equitable partnerships. And it is indeed a challenge that we have faced time and time again in um, with restrictions on our funding mechanisms being able to develop truly equitable partnerships between um, UK Western researchers and and global South researchers and they are so crucial to making the research meaningful in the context that it's um, that it's being applied in to really understand the, the local context and we cannot simply think um, you know a UK researcher rocking up can make the same have the same impact um, as somebody um, as somebody local. Um, so I'm going to stop there because I think um, I'll start repeating others um, if I go on. 
Thanks, Pam, and thanks to all of you for some really insightful questions. Uh, we've, we're getting some questions now coming through in the chat, and I'm going to uh, start putting those to you in just a moment. And it does strike me as well, just as sort of as food for thought as you're reflecting on the questions that come in. Um, you know, many of the things that um, you've raised in the panel and this conversation are, are I think they're, they're, they're often seen as hard to do things. So, you know, it's, it's that attention to relationships. It's working at the systems level. It's, um, it's incentivizing different kinds of behavior. It's, uh, it's, it's being more often in a listening and learning mode instead of just a sort of providing uh, mode. Um, it's working with different kinds of timelines. It's making connections between complex issues which require interdisciplinarity, but are, is often difficult to do in practice because so much research does um, exist in fairly entrenched uh, disciplinary areas. So, so I think these are, these are tough things to grapple with, but they also seem really essential things to grapple with. You know, if we, it's almost if we don't, we're going to be seriously stuck. So perhaps as I'm going to put some more questions to you now that uh, participants are sharing. And, uh, you know, you may reflect on, on these a little bit as we, as we go. So here's the first question from the chat. With so much research and evidence coming from so many different sources, how can donors filter to find what they need and how can researchers themselves aid that process? Does there need to be more coordination or self-organization by researchers at times of crisis? And that's from Sophie Robinson from IDS. That's from Sophie Robinson from IDS. Thank you, Gary. Uh, and then another question from, uh, I believe it's, uh, it's Diana Zayed. Diana Zayed. Thanks, yeah. Gary. Um, Interested in your respective perspectives on how research in the midst of a global crisis that seems to be being treated by many individual nations with rather inward and insular thinking, so for example, imposing lockdowns without coordination, prioritizing domestic resources for domestic crises, how can, how can that be done more cooperatively across regions? Again, what can researchers do to ensure that their own research during a crisis is not just modeled in Western institutions based on secondary and remote data. So we're seeing plenty of examples of institutions based in, in the West and the North providing models that seem to be influencing policymakers in their response to COVID-19. To what extent have these models taken into consideration local conditions in different countries, particularly in the global South? So I think that's a, an excellent question as well. Um, and then another question from James, uh, again at IDS. Uh, COVID science often seems contradictory. New evidence undermines earlier facts and different governments use different data. What does this mean for research funders' concepts of research uptake if the evidence itself is constantly changing? So another good question. Uh, and I'm going to offer one more before I turn it back to you on the panel. There's a few more coming, so we'll give you a first shot at these. This is from Georgie at uh, the University of Brighton Students' Union. Um, one of the most outcomes of research, out, the most important outcomes of research is making it accessible to local populations, and in particular those who don't work within academic research. How do you ensure research is both accessible and understandable to all individuals within a population to ensure research is not only available to those with academic privilege? So some really great questions there. There are more coming in. Let's start with those. Who would like to have first crack? I'm going to open it up to you. To uh, You can either just jump in or we've got this little hand function for our panelists. <laughs> Maggie, I see you're reaching for your mute button. Do you want to go first? Hi. Sure. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start just with the point around um, synthesis and um, how do donors, what, what role can donors play in terms of all the breadth and body of the research that's coming in that they're seeing? And I think that that's a really good question because um, in a way, um, donors themselves are seeing, are, are sitting in a particular vantage point where they can see uh, across a wide cohort of research and, and across disciplines, as Pam was saying, how important that is, um, and, and make linkages and connect the dots. So, I mean, one way, and that will be a focus um, for International Development Research Center moving forward, 
when one responsibility we think we have is to add value in, by synthesizing and engaging with, you know, not only internally to IDRC, but with grantees to help us synthesize this information to make better use of it. So, um, and that can be, you know, new, that can be really rigorous in terms of how we do it um, methodologically, but it can also connect to learning and what we're learning across our grantees and, and making sure that there's space included in the way that we fund research to allow um, the people we're working with to connect and learn from each other peer to peer, to publish what they're learning and to, um, to really take that up as they're moving forward. So part of how we're responding is by putting more resources um, as an institution into the synthesis and to using what we already have um, in addition to moving on to new things, which tends to be the, um, the, the trend with donors is always moving on to something new. Thanks, Maggie. Pam. And I just building on what, what Maggie was saying, I totally agree that the, the synthesis piece of connecting the dots between different um, different research projects and different bodies of activity is so important. Something that we've it's something that we've tried to do through a number of our programs. And when we have um, uh, schemes that focus on a particular area, you know, we can bring researchers that are funded under that under that call together to say right you know what can we share what can we learn one thing that we have struggled with and i think this this uh speaks to the question about you know self-coordination and self-organization by researchers something that we've struggled with is incentivizing researchers to do that synthesis piece um when people can be very researchers that can be so focused on their projects and rightfully so you know that's that's their primary responsibility is to conduct that body of research incentivizing them to look beyond that project and connect with another when there are so many other pressures on their time is really challenging so i think there needs to be there needs to be an appetite amongst the research community to see the value of doing that um, and do and ideally do a bit of that self-organization and that coordination between between projects to to help donors and policymakers filter through that evidence because um certainly from from our point of view we're not the experts the researchers are the experts and are best placed to to make the most sense out of that out of that knowledge um and i'll, I'll pause and think about another answer in a minute Thanks, Pam. So I think we're, we're getting good responses around, you know, potential opportunities for collectivization of researchers and also for synthesis and being able to communicate those syntheses out to people, hopefully in ways which are uh, accessible and, uh, you know, can be used by, by very different communities. Um, what about this question, perhaps Jonathan or Norma, which relates in particular to um, the extent to which particularly, uh, let's say, Global North Western funding and influencing organizations are really grounding their work or, or really bringing in the realities on the ground from the global south both in informing and shaping their research happy to come in on that um one yeah. quick, one quick response on the addition on the previous question though is i think that sometimes research funders are well positioned to play a coordinating role sometimes researchers are but part of it to me is supporting research organizations and organizations like the policy research councils that and science research councils that the idrc is working with that are close enough to the context to do some of that judi judicious work themselves on this point about um about elitism in research i think this is something that our community really needs to grapple with and take very take quite seriously and pay more attention to than we have in the past and it may be that at the end of the day, there are parts of this work that is inherently an elite activity, but that there are some things we can do. Some quick partial responses of things that I've seen work before. One is asking researchers or requiring researchers when appropriate to go back and share findings with the communities that this work is all about 
and in a way, often in partnership with NGOs that really have a great deal of experience working with these communities and understanding what their challenges and opportunities are. Another is citizen generated data and data, for example, what the PAL network, the People's Action for Learning Network does that where citizens themselves are part of gathering these data and where that fact and the fact that citizens themselves are then often the ones to present it can be part of an evidence base that a government considers an in decision making. And the final is the work that others referred to earlier in terms of breaking down results based on the impact on different marginalized populations. That can still, of course, be an elite activity driven by researchers, but at least we're better accounting for the realities of everyone and the differential realities across work. And then quickly coming in on the COVID um, question around modeling, I think that the models have not fully accounted for the differences across contexts. And I think that that's where there's a great role to play both for modelers and others to be pushing on models to be inclusive as possible, but also for knowledge translators to be really understanding when models fall short and pushing to make those, to help policymakers make the best of that information, contextualizing it to understand where it doesn't fully speak to their context. Thanks, Norma. Great. And I appreciate you picking up on that last question as well. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, I wanted to pick up on the, the question about coordinating uh, research. I mean, what we really must avoid is portal proliferation syndrome that we get in international development where creating another Uber, you know, aggregator for everything um, that instantly gets ignored and we've all been guilty of that. But I think what would be helpful uh, is if we could do more pooling resources from donors for when we want to commission uh, synthesis or reviews of evidence. Um, however, I, I did organize a, a round table of this with, with various donors a few years ago. Uh, Norma, I can't remember if you were there, but you know, it was certainly, you know, Welcome Trust, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, and et cetera. And they, I might as well have asked people to murder their own children because the idea of pooling resources across multiple different uh, donors and countries uh, and then letting go was just unheard of. And, and I kind of get that. But there's so often I see that we're asking the same questions when it comes to the synthesis, can, can we do things together? But I, I also want to respond to that final question about the contradictory nature of evidence. Uh, and this goes back to my point about the enlightenment view of, of social science uh, and science itself, actually, which is, I'm afraid this is the nature of the beast. It's all very contingent. Uh, there is no magic bullet. It's all about um, adapting and learning. And, um, you know, to paraphrase F. Scott Fitzgerald about, you know, the test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas that uh, function at the same time. Now, government might not be able to do that, but I think we, we have to. It's just the nature of the beast uh, and differences across countries. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, so we'll all be grappling with that one, about how we, how we respond to it. Um, and now it's a good segue as well into another uh, few questions which are coming in, and I'll just encourage participants also to continue feeding them. Uh, several questions here which relate to how do we, how do we monitor and, and evaluate and how do we learn. So uh, the first one from Zimmer MD, considering the difficulty in measuring the impact of research on policy and practice due to time frames, how are your projects? colleagues on the panel, which aim to improve the uptake of research, monitored and evaluated. So that's a good, a good question, which I, I like particularly. Um, now we also have one from Francis Cobino. Beyond assessing the impact potential of a single project and the contribution of the donor to this, how do the donors on the call learn for, about the impact of their work on local research systems? So again, a good, an, another good question. Uh, we've heard a lot about that connection between um, working, you know, obviously on, on specific research initiatives, but connecting up to the broader system. How do we learn about the impact that we can have on that? And then from Rhiannon McCluskey, uh, she appreciated Pamela's point about how demonstrating instrumental impact, instrumental impact is easier than other types of impact, for example, conceptual capacity building network. But do you have any insights perhaps from all of the panelists, on how to get funders, donors to, to valorize or recognize these other types of impact or how to demonstrate you know, going beyond 
the instrumental. So I think we've got a good group of questions there about uh, you know learning, monitoring, evaluating different dimensions of impact and and change. So Jonathan, while I've got you right in front of me, uh, of my screen, how about I start with you? Okay, yeah, good questions. Um, the, the measuring impact one is uh, is something uh, I've been really grappling where I'm based. Uh, I'm based in uh, Nesta, which is an uh, international uh, NGO, even though it was part of the UK government previously. And uh, we're trying to get more sophisticated measures where we talked about um, uh, more public value. And that seemed to be quite helpful because impact, for some reason, we got very bogged down and we always wanted to go for the instrumental. Um, now, I haven't fixed it, but actually I found the ESRC approach to policy impact. And I think one of the questions that touch on that, things like conceptual and so forth, uh, although it's harder to get a number on it, even having it as a category that we're, we're interested in these other types of value and benefit, um, and you know, not getting too het up about a particular number, but just saying, please, please think about it was, was very helpful. And, and that's the one I, I go for. But what, I, what I found with the measuring impact, though, was that it just depended which area you're working on. Yeah, so somebody working in uh, creative and cultural projects based around the arts humanities, you're just going to have to have something that's very different rather than a one size fits all that works for all donors in all domains. Uh, but I'd love to hear from the other donors about how they how they figure this out. Thanks, Jonathan. And maybe we'll go, Pam, if you don't mind, I'll come to you next, uh, since uh, you know one of our questioners appreciated your comments. Uh, how would you go beyond looking at impact of the more instrumental types of research? Yeah, I think focusing on that, um, I don't have the answer. And I think put, putting a value on those kinds of impacts is, is incredibly difficult. And I don't know, um, I don't know of any answers to, to how you do that. What I do think we can do, and perhaps actually the, the coronavirus situation at the moment gives us an opportunity to tell a bit of a story um, of you know the the basic research and the behavioral science and the epidemiology and the virology um, all of the all of the different aspects of the research that are currently providing evidence to governments in terms of coronavirus and how to respond and how we can tackle the virus can we can we go backwards from that and find where some of that research originated and tell that story of how the basic conceptual knowledge generation research has ultimately, perhaps by a very roundabout route, led to having this instrumental impact. And I think if we can get more stories like that, and I think the um, uh, Ebola six years ago, I think is you know another another good example of telling a story of research into into impact. Um, the more stories we can get like that the easier it is to uh to to demonstrate the value of that kind of conceptual um that kind of conceptual impact um so i think it has to be about stories because i think quantifying it is is so difficult thanks pam and uh, I'll, I'll turn to norma and, and maggie now as well but there's just another question came in which i'll just add to the current mix because i think it's very related actually from kelly kelly shepherd at ids um how can funders support enlightened thinking when their monitoring systems are quite often set up in rather linear ways what are the panelists favorite innovative monitoring evaluation and learning techniques so maggie i think i'll come to you because there's a lot of uh, i think exciting, innovative male stuff that's going on at IGRC. What's your take on that or indeed the other questions? Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> Thanks for the excellent questions as well. I think these are all on point to the different things that we're, we're really grappling with, as Pam said, and we don't have all the answers, but we're, we're trying to think about them. Um, I think the point that Jonathan made earlier about we have to be we have to resist the urge, I think, in a lot of cases to be too generic in terms of our monitoring and evaluation systems and what we can extract from kind of aggregate uh, impact. 
Um, and so in setting out monitoring and evaluation frameworks that are specific enough to a particular entry point, I think that's extremely important. Um, so what we do at IDRC typically is we work through for a for a particular um, entry point where we've identified an outcome that we hope that our research will contribute to or we intend that our research will contribute to, we set out quite clearly, not as a, a set in stone framework or not as a um, an attempt to predict what the research will lead to because I think that that's also impossible and not, and not helpful, but as a way to, to, to anticipate the types of impacts that we're going to be looking for along that trajectory, um, along that time trajectory, but also uh, in terms of where the research support goes. So for example, you know, looking at what's within our direct control. Um, what do we uh, value and consider to be high quality research? And that in itself, I think, speaks to the point earlier about the question of valorizing or uh, validating um, different factors like the extent to which local knowledge is developed and brought into a methodology, the extent to which engagement with local actors and validation of, um, of a research question or a research process along the way is important. Um, I think that um, changing those incentives in terms of um, bringing thinking around knowledge translation earlier into, uh, into an earlier stage of the research methodology is an incredibly important um, thing that we have to change in terms of um, what we expect of the research grants that we're funding. So looking at what's in our direct control and how can we change the incentives to improve um, what we think are important factors that will lead to impact down the line, while we may not be able to follow that impact you know, 20 years into the future in all cases. But also thinking about where we can push okay, this is in our direct control. This is something we can really think about intelligently about how we incentivize, but also what are those areas of influence where we, we're gonna wanna capture the stories because they're extremely important, but we're not going to be able to tell, we're not gonna be able to predict those stories and predict numbers or targets around those stories and the influence and the impact, sorry, from that influence. So where can we qualify kind of types of impact, types of influence that we expect to get out of a particular investment and then follow those along the line to properly communicate what came out of those, uh, recognizing that some will be well into the future. Thanks, Maggie. And uh, perhaps I'll, I'll just throw in a, a little promotion for IDRC's work as well. Uh, all those on the call may be interested in the, the really interesting work on something called Research Quality Plus, which is a great framework for trying to understand different dimensions to the quality of research, and then also then understanding, you know, how would you actually go about evaluating that? And I think that's taking a much more sort of holistic and systemic approach to actually thinking about the whole nature of research quality and then what are the implications for evaluating and learning. So for those who are interested, that would be something to uh, to check out, I would say. I'm, uh, I'm sure they can find out more information on the IDRC web website, Maggie, probably, yeah? Yep, idrc.ca slash rq plus. Great, thanks. And Norma. Thanks, Peter. I think that it's helpful if we all take a bit of a step back and ask what is our purpose for monitoring? What are we trying to learn? And broadly speaking, I think that often funders are confronted with both what decisions they need to make and then how they can learn about how to improve their work over time. I think that to the extent that we, so I'll talk a little bit more about how we at Hewlett have approached those things, but I'll also say that I recognize that we at Hewlett have the privilege of being a private charitable foundation that's a little more flexible. And I think that there might be an opportunity for collective action so that um, donors who are part of, some donors who are part of governments or other entities that may have a little bit less flexibility can frankly let go of the need to demonstrate that every single project led to impact, which is not always realistic, and more focus on these two key points of learning from a portfolio and making better decisions going forward. 
At Hewlett, our approach is very much based on individual tailored approaches for particular research grantees, which are usually taking on a portfolio of projects, and also really learning about whether our whole portfolio is on or off track. So specifically, we're asking ourselves three questions. One is whether we, and look, really looking at whether we have some big wins across our portfolio, knowing that we'll never know the impact of all projects and that not all projects will ultimately have impact given the nature of this work. One question is, do we have some really compelling stories of ways in which research and other data work we funded led to improvements on lives? Not all research will do that, and to Pamela's point, there's other purposes of research, but at the end of the day, if we don't have some compelling stories about that where we believe our money was part of making the difference, we really have to take a step back and ask ourselves if we need to be doing things differently. Similarly, we ask about whether we've had impact on changing, contributing to changes in government systems, particularly because this road building approach is one where we really very much do feel in learning mode about whether and how non-governmental organizations can change systems. And finally, we ask ourselves about our impact on the field and on the ecosystems. And we do learn a lot from unpacking these particular examples of success and how we see success and what contributed to individual big wins, which at the end of the day could be what justifies the whole expenditure of our portfolio. Thanks, Norma. Great. Now we're moving up towards the end of the, of the seminar. We've got about 10 minutes left and I know that we, we need to make sure that we finish on time. So what I'm gonna do is we've just got uh, three more questions which have come in and then I'll just pose those and then I'll ask each of our panelists just to do a sort of wrapping up. So you might like to respond to this uh, final little round of questions and you may also just have some final thoughts that you'd like to share as well on the, the bigger conversation. So the first one's quite a provocative one from Laura. Um, how about research uptake related to evidence generated about donors themselves? How much appetite do our panelists see in their own institutions to look at research done on aid and development cooperation? So that's a great, uh, great question. Um, also, Ruth Stewart, uh, glad you're joining us, Ruth, from um, the Director of the Africa Center for Evidence. We anticipate the economic, social, political fallout will be far greater than COVID itself. Can you share how funders are gearing up now to help us help our governments to get ahead of that curve? That's a great question as well. In fact, those are our, our last two questions. So research on your own institutions and on the sort of the whole funding and uh, development sort of um, uh, approach and, and ways of working. And then also how can we look beyond COVID uh, to this sort of the greater implications and possible fallouts that likely we're all going to experience. What can we do as well to help our governments get ahead of that curve? And I think these are good practical questions which speak to some of the things that we've been uh, discussing as we've gone. So let's make this our final round. Um, um, perhaps, Norma, can I come to you? Because again, you're the one I'm seeing on my screen in front of me. So uh, perhaps I could ask you first of all to, to give us your thoughts and any final conclusions as well would be great. Oh, thanks for the, these two great questions and for the whole panel discussion. I think when it comes to research uptake generated about donors themselves, I personally do see appetite in Hewlett and in other institutions. And I think just as with the other, other kinds of research strategies that we've been talking about, the same techniques apply to have a greater shot at, at influence. So co-creating research with decision makers, making people feel bought into the context and really customizing one's recommendations to the realities of the institution itself. I regularly get suggestions for donors that simply don't apply to the kind of work that I do. But when I have a conversation with someone who truly understands Hewlett, then it's much easier to put recommendations into practice, both with the work I do directly and what I can share with colleagues. Um, to Ruth's excellent question about the fallout from COVID, I think all I would I think all of us are still grappling with how to handle this and how to handle limited budgets with resources for many of our own institutions diminishing in this context. And I think one of the most important things is the tried and true strategy that I, I know that many of us share of flexible support to organizations that are closer to the ground to respond, which is important both in terms of mitigation, but also as we think about the long road to recovery, 
I'm very humble about how much I at Hewlett will truly understand about what the priorities are in South Africa and Bangladesh and other countries, and really just understanding the partners that have a track record of helping governments navigate these issues is going to be, and getting them funding quickly to prepare is going to be helpful. Um, and then finally, in terms of just other closing words, it's you know clear that there's a lot to continue learning together. And key themes I've heard around areas for continued discussion include this point about learning about how to learn, but also thinking about why we're learning and what points are most important for the community as a whole to be measuring and what measurement we should just let go of. Second, this point about changing government systems and really, you know, as we try to change the research ecosystem or, as Jonathan said, how governments themselves become evidence friendly, what we can learn together about what is and isn't effective there. And then finally, this point about mutually respectful partnerships and how we can go about the hard work of supporting and promoting those from, between researchers across continents. Brilliant, Norma, thanks. And uh, I appreciate that those are great summing up points as well for things that you've heard as well as responding to the questions. Uh, Maggie. Thanks, and thanks, Peter, um, and to IDS for, for organizing the session. I think it was really excellent, and I feel like I've learned more than I've contributed, so I look forward to engaging with, with the panelists and others going forward. Um, I think in terms of the question around appetite for learning on research, research on research or research on donor funding, I do think that there is quite an appetite um, for this work. Um, I'll knock on wood, but I think there's a real appetite also to acknowledge failure, even you know, in the public sector, um, which I think my colleagues maybe in the private sector, philanthropic sector for um, changing that culture and encouraging and recognizing that we need to expect, especially in the research field, that some things will, will fail, they won't pan out. And that's, an, that's just as important. And it's what we learn from, um, from research failures that can be just as important as research successes. So I think there's also a real appetite, um, as Norma mentioned, to uh, use our own internal evidence as well, whether it be evidence from um, the data on what we're supporting, uh, the evidence coming from evaluations, the evidence coming from other donors, in order to think about um, our own decision making going forward and our own prioritization. So I do think that that's a positive space um, where I've seen lots of, over the last couple of years, lots of different fora opening up of donors to talk frankly to each other about um, what's working and what's not. In terms of the response to COVID, I mean, the positive thing that I'm seeing from my vantage point is that given the urgency, given the, the need to work together, um, there is this um, call, uh, at least I can say on the Canadian, um, in the Canadian context, to work across sectors, to really bring all the tools we have in our toolkit um, to, to uh, bear to deal with this crisis. So I I'm, I'm, think that's a very positive front. There's a real appetite for evidence from the public sector, from those making decisions within the government. So I think that's a really positive uh, space that we need to contribute to as the research sector. In terms of um, the big ideas or the big things that, that I heard that I'd really like to continue to, um, to converse about across this group and beyond, um, this whole question of flexible funding and how we're being flexible with our grantees to allow them the space to uh, respond, to change, to pivot as needed, given that they're so well placed to uh, see those policy windows and see those opportunities to connect research for change. Uh, the second point I heard, um, which I think we need to think more about, is international collaboration on research, connecting the local um, domestic space to these wider global challenges. 
And then the thirdly, um, the importance of the enabling environment and local leadership and what it takes to sustain that um, local leadership beyond uh, research funding, but, but looking at other funding for other systems level support. Thanks, Maggie. Great. Jonathan. Yeah, so I'll be quick. I think in terms of uh, evidence from donors themselves, um, what I'd really like to see is more experiments or uh, you know, rigorous evaluations of the way that we give out money. Uh, in fact, we were talking to some big donors before the crisis about this. You know, is grant giving still the best way to give out money? You know, I've, I've worked in three or four big grant giving organizations. Uh, I'm also currently helping uh, some colleagues who do something different where they give challenge prizes and base it around a, the money around competing for a, for a prize. But what is the best way and the fairest way? And how do you avoid groupthink and not going to the usual suspects? Um, some of that research is, you know, is decades old, but we can also apply it on ourselves. So I think uh, that sort of way of the way we give money, I think we can be much more evidence based about. Uh, the second question from Ruth about the aftermath of COVID, that, that would also like, I'd like to be my sort of summary point in that uh, it's been very sad how the old nation state has, uh, you know, the, the, the walls have gone up and we haven't uh, done nearly enough, despite the best efforts of the World Health Organization. Even in groups like Europe, you know, people have not shared vital information or pieces of equipment. Um, but isn't there something finer about the world we live in and research that always feels innately collaborative? Um, I mean, it can be bickery, uh, but there is something fine in, in what we do and, and certainly international uh, and open to other voices. So uh, I'd just like to, to, to encourage that. But right now, all I'm hearing, certainly from the NGO sector, is we just need to survive. You know? So is there anything that donors can do just to get some liquidity in there? to help people tie people over, I think would be essential. Thanks, Jonathan. Really good points. And especially that last one, we're hearing a lot about that, that huge challenge too, for just survival of organizations at this time. Yeah. And uh, Pam, final thoughts from you. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll try and be brief because I'm aware we're, uh, we've run out of time already. Um, so I think in terms of the, the evidence about funders, um, so we as, our, we as a public funder of research get, you know, reviewed occasionally, um, particularly things like the Global Challenges Research Fund and the Newton Fund, we get scrutinized uh, by the Independent Commission for Aid Impact, um, who have reviewed uh, our different programs um, over the last few years and, you know, generate quite a lot of useful feedback on how we can improve things and we try and take that on board as much as we can to improve what we're doing and improve our systems. Likewise there's been um, a bit of work going on recently looking at research evidence about the peer review process um, and how we can take on board some of that evidence to make our processes, the processes by which we, uh, we commission research uh, better, fairer, more efficient, more effective. Um, so absolutely I think there's definitely appetite within um, within UKRI to learn how we can do things better. Um, on the the final question, um, really fascinating question, you know, this, this the economic, social and political fallout post virus. Um, I was talking to a colleague about this this morning and um, uh, I think, you know, the the activity that's going on within UKRI at the moment is, as Jonathan says, it's about survival. It's about what do we need, what research do we need to do right now in order to tackle this and in order to get through to the other side. For me, the more interesting research comes after um, in understanding what, what, the, what the broader fallout of this virus is, you know, when we're on top of it, when there's a vaccine, when it's not, it's not a crisis anymore. Um, what difference will things make? And I think that's a really fascinating thing that we need to start thinking about now so that we can, um, so that we can better understand um, what we need to do next. Um, on another kind of slant to it, um, I think there's a real challenge for existing research activities that are 
particularly uh, development research activities. We've got one project, um, one of the GCRF research hubs, which is looking at south-south migration corridors. Ha they've halted all field work because they just can't be doing that field work anymore. But looking at kind of economic migration through south-south corridors, that migration has stopped. And when we come out the other side of, of COVID, what's that corridor going to look like? Is migration going to go back to how it was before? Or is it going to look fundamentally different? In terms of education systems, you know, they've all been put on hold. What, what does that mean kind of when we get through, when we get to the other side? Um, what research do we need to do to understand that? But also how do we need to frame exist, reframe existing research projects? within a new world context, because the world is going to be different after this. Um, and existing research projects might have to completely rethink what they're looking at and how they're looking at it in order to, um, in order to take things forward. Um, I think that's gonna be my final thought. Great, thanks so much, Pam. And uh, even in the midst of that, I was glad that your cat managed to put in a last minute appearances before we ended the call. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I just would like to say, first of all, there are still a few questions coming in, which we haven't got time for now, but you know, every uh, panelist will be able to sort of check out the, the chat. There was a question, for example, on how the COVID crisis will affect scholarship funders for PhD research for especially international scholars. So I, I think, um, you know, thanks to all of the, the questions and to all the participants on the call. Thank you all to our panelists, uh, you know, I think for uh, joining us from home um, you know, managing many, many different things in your lives, as I think everyone is doing at the moment, uh, all simultaneously. And as well, probably for uh, some of you, for having been on calls probably for much of the day already, and for maintaining such a, a keen awareness of the possibilities and some really strong messages, I think, around collaboration, around learning, around ways of uh, just connecting up our shared efforts, both as funders and as researchers, but also many different other actors in the broader uh, research and evidence system, uh, including governments, um, a whole range of different uh, organizations and representatives of uh, communities, civil society, um, and, and other actors on the ground in many, many different contexts. So I think these are all things that will be a, the basis for continued conversation. Just to say, too, that if you would like to watch this seminar again, you will be able to find it on the IDS website. You also find related links to the Shaping Policy and Evidence short course and links to previous evidence into policy and practice seminars, which are worth taking a look at. And the, uh, the link is in the chat there uh, so that you can find, you can hit that link and go and see previous seminars as well as re-watching this one. So on that note, uh, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to Gary and Sarah, particularly in the background for facilitating this and helping our technology to work. Thank you to all participants, wherever you may be. And I wish you uh, health and safety wherever you are. And we look forward to continuing this conversation, which I'm sure does not end today. It's something that we're going to continue thinking about, um, particularly as we go through this current uh, major global challenge, but beyond, as uh, our panelists have really stressed, we need to rethink, we need to reimagine, and we need to re-engage all of our thinking practice around development and related research. So this is a challenge for all of us collectively. We look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks very much for joining. And at this point, we'll say goodbye.